The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This podcast is brought to you by Challenger, who believe in providing customers with financial security for a better retirement. Challenger's lifetime annuities provide different payment solutions to suit your client's financial circumstances and needs. For income certainty, they can choose CPI indexed or fixed payments. Alternatively, they can choose to have payments linked to changes in the RBA cash rate or investment markets. Challenger can provide your clients with a monthly income for life so they can enjoy today knowing they'll always have income in the future. This week I talked to Mitch Ramsbotham, the Group General Manager at Coastal Advice Group. Oh, what a good conversation. I honestly could have spoken to him for hours and hours, but I'm sure that you would have hated me if I'd have made it that long. So we niche down on a couple of things. How to create a scorecard for staff that is balanced, keeps the accountability and has a level of autonomy and control for employees. And we talked about marketing and how to make sure that you are attracting the right people for your business, but also for advisors specifically. I really enjoyed today's chat and I hope that you do too. Hi, Mitch. Good morning, Jesse. I'm so excited for today's conversation and we should say we're in the same room. I know. It feels odd. I haven't been back to the city for a while. Yes. There's lots of people. There are lots of people, but um, I've actually not done a podcast with a real life human next to me. This is exciting. This is exciting. It was exciting before even knowing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You and I have known each other for a long time, haven't seen each other for a long time. Yeah. This is going to be pretty cool. It is going to be really cool. There's <laughs> lots to cover. And what's um interesting perhaps about both of our backgrounds is we've both come from corporate land and gone into the advice land and there's some big things that I know you've pulled out of there and brought into your new world, which I definitely want to get stuck into today. I'm very excited about today's chat. Our problem will be my problem most of the time, which is keeping us on track and on time. But uh, I think as a starting point, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of knowing you for many, many years, can we just do a brief intro as to who is Mitch and what is your story? Sure. It's always good. Mm. Context before content. It always makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, so Mitch Ramsbotham, I am currently the Group General Manager of the Coastal Advice Group, mm -hmm. which is um, an institutionally licensed, a, a larger institutionally licensed um, full-service financial planning business, mm -hmm. um, headquartered out of Newcastle, but with four, we could say five, given there's a there's a serviced office type situation in there as well, mm -hmm. um, but four core offices up and down the east coast of New South Wales at this point. Yeah, cool. Um, before moving across into that side, as you alluded to, um, I worked in product distribution for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I originally started my career um, in financial services as an advisor, coming through trainee and into an advisor role, mm. um, then took the leap out into product distribution, which I did for many, many years through BDM into then uh, strategic partnerships management for a large insurer, mm -hmm. um, which I suppose gave me the opportunity to meet a lot of fantastic people, mm -hmm. garner a lot of really interesting ideas about the way that practices and businesses work, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately led me to the relationship that I have with our now CEO mm. um, 
and enabled this move across into a completely different thing. <laughs> it's so different. It's so different. <laughs> but that's the exciting part of it, I suppose, too. Yeah. And you have a real life. You have small babies. I, I, I am a real person. You are a real person. Um, I have two little babies, two beautiful little girls, Piper and Aubrey. Mm-hmm. Piper is three. Mm-hmm. Aubrey is has just turned two. Mm-hmm. So I, I really stayed in the pain. We, mm. we, we had the <laughs> really close. Mm. We just thought, well, while it hurts, let's just, let's do it. Be efficient. But they're beautiful. They're ah. amazing. They're amazing. Brave of you to jump out of a, of a pretty known environment into something quite new, quite different with small children and COVID. Mm-hmm. How has that been? Um, tough. So the second lockdown of COVID. So I've been there now for 13, 14 months. Mm. I started in a senior management position in this business um, with my particular arm of the organisational chart looking like oh, probably roughly 15 people at that particular point in time. Yep. Now it's about a little over 20 mm-hmm. that, sit, that sits on that side of the business. Mm-hmm. Um with it, you know, with a bit of a reshuffle in there um, midstream, but all of these people that I had been brought on board to to manage and you know management and leadership of a team is a, is a contact sport. It, yeah. It's if you're not there with them to to try to um, build any sort of relationship and and. And, and mutual reciprocal relationship, especially for people to know who you are, what you're about, what your value set is, those sorts of things. So hard to do mm. when you're in a business for four weeks mm. across multiple different locations and you dive into lockdown. Yeah. So I was forced to try to build these relationships with this team that I lead over the airwaves. Yeah. Which was, which was a struggle. But, but that, to their credit, they're all, Beautiful, very accepting people. We have a fantastic team in the business. It was a struggle, probably personally, because I like mm. face-to-face, mm. touchy-feely interaction. Yeah, uh, It's the way that I'm put together. Um, so for me, I struggled not being able to – I personally struggled not being able to do that. But we got there. We've done all the things. Woohoo! Yeah. Let's do a one-minute overview of the style of business you're in for context because mm. some of the things that I want to deep dive in are quite – Unique, but I mm. think without really understanding the type of business that you're in, yep. in in a bit more detail, it probably isn't going to help um, understand how you've brought some of these things to life and sure. the scale that you've had to um, sure. consider as so well. So, what sort of things would you like to touch on? So, let's talk about how many are in your team. Okay. Let's talk about the types of uh, fee-paying clients that you have, mm-hmm. um, how many, if you're comfortable talking about that. Sure. And just if you can give everyone a sense of – like the volume of work okay. your team work on. Um, so Coastal Advice has Coastal Advice started a few years ago now um, under our CEO Daniel as a as a sole practitioner with a few support people around him. It's crazy. We have now grown to forty plus staff on shore mm-hmm. with two different offshore support teams, one providing operational services, the other providing advice document delivery. Mm -hmm. Um, So I suppose you could probably add them to the headcount as well because that relationship still requires management. So it's a a big beast. Yeah. There is 14 advisors in the team, um, which which accounts for 10 full-time equivalents. So that says that um, that we do and are really big on flexibility as well so we do have a few part-timers in the team which so i know that cool. yeah you said for, uh, for you was a, a bit of a mind blower it, it does create a few um logistical hurdles i suppose okay but nothing's insurmountable it, in a business it, it, once you get to a certain scale you find that if that you find that you've got the ability to really operationally move things around from a capacity point of view if you don't have just one one person performing a role that needs to directly correlate to the way that somebody else works if you've got a team of people doing something and you can plug your people from a support point of view or a task delivery point of view into a team of individuals that know what they need to do it's really really easy to manage units of work in and out i suppose is the easiest way to 
to mm, put it. Mm. And it means you don't lose high caliber talent when they want that part-time opportunity or you actually attract high caliber talent who are looking for that part-time opportunity. So huge kudos to you. I haven't heard of any slash very many advice businesses being able to do that, but um, we're going to talk about the scale. So, so you've got 14 people, but the equivalent of 10 FTEs. Yeah, 14 advisors, yeah. the equivalent of, um, of 10 FTE. Client-wise, um, we've done, and this is going to sound mental, and it has been. It is. We've done, we did five acquisitions in the last 12 months. Yeah, that is mental. Yep, it is. Um, all of which come with their own struggles. Some have been within our licensee, which makes it a little easier. Mm. Um, some have been mergers, which means that we've had the individual stay, which again has its efficiencies, the, 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 perpetuation of that individual being in the business and what that means from an advice delivery point of view was significant. Mm. So mergers were great. Some were mergers that then turned into acquisitions because the people left midstream, which had its own struggles. Mm. Um, some were pure acquisitions. So there was a, there's a lot of moving parts in there. There's a lot of different things that needed to be done. And that means that we have amassed um, at this particular point in time, Roughly 900 fee-paying client groups, which may be an individual or a couple. So there's well in excess of, a, of 1,500 clients at this particular point in time individually within our business. Um, I'm stressed just listening to you, mm. thinking about you've only been in the business just over a year. You've got quite a lot of people that you manage. You've got lots and lots going on from an M&A perspective and you've got little babies. Mm. <laughs> I... I'm going to ask you at the end about looking after yourself because I think that that's a really important piece, but just a huge congrats. I mean, the fact that you've done it and no doubt it has challenges is is a huge success, but I want to talk more about some of the things that um, I think are quite unique to what you have brought into the business from that sort of corporate mm. background. And you and I were chatting um, before this podcast and there was so much that we wanted to talk through, but we thought it was better to actually just focus on a couple of things and really double down on them and get really nitty gritty into how you implemented mm. it, what worked, what didn't, etc. Mm. One of the things that you did was bring in a concept that's quite widely known and accepted in corporate worlds called a balanced scorecard, which I want to go through in more detail, mm. but very few small businesses would know probably or use a balanced scorecard. Mm. From your perspective, before we get stuck into how you've implemented it, why did you want to implement – what is a balanced scorecard and why did you want to bring it into this business? Okay, so uh, there was there's a number of different reasons why. Um, our business going from one advisor and a couple of support staff evolving over the last uh, – you, you know, evolving over the years into what now is a behemoth, mm. you need a framework. And you don't just need a framework. It, it – it, the evolution of our business from a small business into a somewhat corporatized, medium-sized business has meant that there's a few things from a risk point of view and a risk mitigation point of view that I'm, I really saw as coming down the barrel that needed to be looked after as well. We are, from a revenue point of view, one of, if not the largest privately owned business within the licensee group that we're in. Yep. That puts you at the top of the table. It puts you in in the headlights. Mm. And that can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Fantastic from an exposure point of view. Access to people, opportunities, all of those sorts of things. Mm. But it's also fraught with danger mm -hmm. because when you're in the headlights, it's not only for the positive reasons and, and you're not looked at just for leadership from a from a get up and go point of view, you, you're looked at from a leadership perspective, from a risk mitigation and risk control measure point of view as well. Mm. So the scrutiny that I could foresee for our business coming down the barrel, yeah. given that exponential growth that we were seeing, I wanted to put something in place to ensure that if and where the regulator or an auditor or the licensee ever stepped into the business, we had a framework around the management of our income-producing staff that ensured that it wasn't purely a sales grab. Yeah. That's not what our business is about anymore. Yeah. Our business is about – I think the banks maybe took it a little too far where it went away from the revenue generation part of mm. what a business is in the first place, and mm. we've seen how that's played out, yeah, right? Yeah, 
so there is, of course, there is a there's a revenue and a and a and a, and a, um, a financial overlay in there, but it is there is business targets, there is individual targets, and there is individual developmental targets as well. They are. It is not purely an arbitrary number that an advisor is given. You know, lick your finger, hold it in the wind, and see what it feels like. There is some rhyme and reason behind how and where the revenue is derived, how it's retained, rather than it just being a, a sales drive, a sales driver, I suppose. And there's a lot more in there as well. We've implemented, for example, Net Promoter Score. We canvas recent clients that have recently gone through implementation within our business mm-hmm. and and uh, have one of our uh, customer service girls in the, in the marketing team call out and actually ask them specific questions about the advisor so not the, the not what they saw from the business yep. about the advisor as an individual their ability to communicate their re- responsiveness to to communications and all of those sorts of things mm. there's an nps driver in there there is a personal education developmental driver in there and some of those are gateways that affect their ability to earn an income so it's not just make us money and you share in it it's make us money do it in the right way look after yourself look after the client and then we share in it Mm. there's a lot more to it so this is frankly a way to have really clear kpis that step away from the revenue only benchmark of how to be successful as an advisor 100 percent. and how did you think about the different streams so those streams that you just talked about are mm. they are they the main sort of streams that you yeah. you have yeah so you've got obviously there is a commercial aspect I mean it's a balanced scorecard so that has to be in there so we there's can't, a, we can't pay money if we don't make money <laughs> right um, so there's a commercial aspect about new clients and retention of existing clients I would imagine absolutely yep there's a piece in there around how good a job did the advisor do in that process so that's the net promoter score yep. piece. Sounds like there's a personal development, education development core component mm-hmm. as well. Is there anything else that you typically measure? Use of technology. So we have a really diverse uh, age and skill demographic within the business and, and building a framework that tries to be, tries to be all things to all people. Um, you find that there's some people that just aren't tech natives and then there's there has to be a driver for people um, – where we make a decision as a business to move to a different tech stack or whatever it may be that we're using to, I won't say drag, but um, uh, incentivize them to come along on, <laughs> on, the, on the journey with you. Yeah. So there's some around the use of, but we really see uh, a lot of value in the tech stack that we're using and the efficiencies, not just the efficiencies that we can get from it, but the the client experience and, and the the attested to client experience that um, clients are seeing from the tech stack that we're using and some of the engagement tools for us uh, as an as an incentive to make sure that there's a consistency in process procedure client outcome and what they're seeing when they walk through the door right um, there had to be an incentive there around the use of technology as well which was another big part so it that has no financial there's no financial driver to that right that as far as part of a balanced scorecard yeah for the ability for our advisors to be metricated on and and part of their ability to earn an income being grafted to simply the use of a technological tool that we're asking them to use for the value of a client outcome is is huge and so can we just drill into that a bit more how do you – so is that like you're a leader and you're like – you're a leader or you're a lagger in terms of using the tech? Like how does that – how do you actually rate or score that practically? A little bit of stick, a little bit of carrot. Yep. So so you're looking at how quickly and frequently does an advisor adapt to the tech that you've asked them to use? Yep. So we have a part of the tech stack, which is becoming more and more common – um, it's a, like a client engagement, fact find, reverse fact find, cash flow modeling type tool. And it is amazing. It is really, really quite cool. The efficiencies of onboarding, the outputs that you get uh, visually in a meeting mm. with the technology, but also the, the documentation that's produced out of the back of it and just the touch and feel of it. 
and the the language in it compared to what advice documents used to look like and, and what PFPs and those sorts of things used to look like, it's on the polar opposite end of the spectrum, right? What what we've done, it's, it's not leaders and laggers, I suppose. And where I say stick and carrot, sometimes you have to force change. And the way that we forced change was um, we put a stake in the ground and said that at, at a particular point in time, the way that we were doing things was no longer going to be supported anymore. So our, our advisors were not going to walk into meetings anymore with a review pack okay with a line by line this asset did that this much this asset did that much there's a lot more to articulating value to a client than sitting in a meeting going through line by line what their performance was the year before last yeah agree. um so this tool the information that we give them now doesn't allow them to walk in with a, a a bound hard copy pack to talk through and like use a highlighter. Mm. It forces them. It forced them to use the technology in a in the highest proportion of circumstances. The ability for the document to pro- to be produced is still there. We just didn't do it for them. Okay. So it was going to take. It was going to be a conscious decision on their part, where we get the numbers out of the software to tell us out of the myriad of meetings during that month, how many of those they've utilised the tool for mm-hmm. and which they have then potentially prepared a pack for. Okay. You're not going to be able to do it for everyone. Yeah. You, ha- you have to be really conscious of the client and what they need and want and what they're going to see as value. If there's an 80-year-old that is going to come through the front door that has doesn't have a smartphone, doesn't have a computer, and you're trying to get them to engage with this technology when they really just want to take something home and read it with a cup of tea, yeah. it would be stupid of you not to give us something to read over a cup of tea. Yeah. So we allow them to do it but took them away from being readily available so that the adoption was there and we can then track the numbers. Fascinating. Is there anything in the scorecard that, it's, as it stands currently that you think could or is there anything that's missing that you want to add in? Or if you were giving advice to someone who's like, oh, this is a really great way for me to get everyone consistently looking at the same sort of metrics, would you be putting in anything else if you could go back in time? Not really. Not, 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 I'll say not at this point. Okay. It will evolve. Of course. But it will evolve with external change events. It's only quite new. Like I said, I've only been there 14 months. Yeah. We did a, we've um, done a six month tr- trial, which has worked quite well. And then the flipped over to a, a 12 month rolling um, basis. Like a review cycle or something. Yeah. Okay. So give, give the opportunity for feedback in that first six months. So don't I'm really big on goal setting and achievement and the alignment of tasks to the individual. And if you've got an unreachable task and that's in front of you for 12 months and you don't agree with the design of something new, if you're just lumped with that for 12 months, it's going to be the most unmotivating thing in the world. Mm. So one of the big things for me was chunking that out into a smaller trial period before moving into, uh, into the larger piece to give the advice team, both myself and the advice team on a, on a collegiate sort of a basis, the ability for feedback either way to say this worked, this didn't work, this isn't fair, this is rubbish, What we may need more support to get to that particular point, all of those sorts of things. And I guess the, um, the feedback loop makes people engaged because they feel like they've co-designed and gets people excited around understanding and having good certainty around what success in their role looks like. But most advisors haven't come from a landscape where a balanced scorecard exists mm. and you've thrown in quite a few m as which no doubt have their own culture and their own style. How have you found it's been getting them on the journey of adopting it, embracing it, enjoy- enjoying it? Can we enjoy it yet? It, yeah, yeah, we can. So yeah. it's it, – it's, I've found it um, – I've found it really good. Okay. And the reason that I say that, and, and I believe, my personal belief, you can, I'll provide your details to the staff and they can give you whatever feedback. Yeah, they can but, text me confidentially, yeah, sure. Correct. Mm-hmm. Um, but I believe that it's fit for purpose across a lot of those different pieces of our business and there's, there's a, a reason why. 
everybody likes the feeling of being trusted and having a level of control and autonomy over the way that they operate, be that um, somebody purely with an employee mindset that's just there to do their nine to five, they still want a level of control and autonomy. Yeah, of course. But with M&A, in a lot of circumstances, and this is one of the big, not stumbling blocks, but hurdles, mm-hmm. is having somebody come into the business, whether that be on an, on an equity basis, c- continued equity basis, so still a business owner, yeah. but operating as an employee, mm. um, there's a there's a real difference in the way that they operate, but the balanced scorecard and the way that I've designed it allowed both of those individuals to continue to engage and see value in the way that they're metricated. The way that I the, the reason that I say that is the way that I derived all of the targets individually that underlie the balanced scorecard in the first place is I broke out. Um, I, I did this with feedback from the team in the design phase in the first place. Very important. I broke out every single advisor, their direct costs, their fair and equitable um, share of what the overarching costs to run the business were. So really now each advisor runs their own small business within our larger business. They have their own balance sheet. If they want more support, they can have more support, but numbers move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They say, I can't do this. I need more of this. I say, cool, you can have that, but it means this. Mm -hmm. Do we agree? And they go, oh, maybe not. I might be able to do it without that. (laughs) So Mm. so as as, as somebody coming from being self-employed to an employee, they still have the ability to say, hey, um, I'd hire somebody else right now. I say, cool, hire somebody else. Just means you've got to do this. Yeah. Fine. As a, as a as an employee, it's also not just an arbitrary number. Yeah. On the other side, right? Employee, it's not just an arbitrary number. Like I said before, you lick your finger and hold it in the wind, and you say you've got to write me X amount this year. Yeah. It is it, it because it gives them credit for the recurring revenue that they've already got. Yep. And their part of, their part of the balance sheet and the profit and loss then just means that if they are doing all of the right things, hitting all of the right benchmarks, doing their education, working efficiently, utilizing the resources properly, following the process, engaging their clients, they might end up at some stage with no new business target, save for whatever the top up might need to be for their attrition, what you know, their organic attrition rate is, right? Yeah. You can have a, an advisor that just goes into a beautiful nirvana of coming in and having fantastic, valuable conversations with clients, engaging them year on year, everybody walking away feeling fulfilled, and they're under a very limited amount of stress. And that, for me, from an employee point of view, yeah. to be running a small business within a business yeah. and having that freedom based on your actions and the way that you, you conduct yourself day to day, being able to affect your future self as well is just so positive. What I love listening to this is when you move, I think having never been in sort of a um, medium or larger um, practice, but I'd imagine when you move up to those sort of levels, you do feel like you've lost a bit of autonomy and control. You do feel like the numbers that have been given to you have come from above with very little rationale or understanding about why and how you've been given that. And yet what you've done is completely flipped that on its head. You've designed it so that they actually are driving, if they want more support, what that number will look like and creating a level of commercial awareness that doesn't typically exist, I think, in medium or large businesses. And you're exactly right. And you find, and you've probably found before too, that ordinarily when you succeed, more often than not you're asked for more. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Right? Stressful. So you work your guts out <laughs> yeah. and you succeed and they go, geez, that, he, they can do that. Let's get them to do it again. Yeah. Whereas here you're rewarded for that. If you do all of the right things in the right ways, you're not pushing the square peg into the round hole and it's not a flash in the pan type scenario where you just need to keep chasing your tail. Yeah. If the advisors in our business are doing all of the right things in the right way and they're floating their own balance sheet, their own little business in the way that they need to. They end up in a really fantastic spot where their 
working they're, they're doing it really easy with all of the support their, their new business targets are really really manageable um, supported by the business and they share it they share in um, the spoils of that as well amazing I want to move on to something but before I do um, and that sort of feeds into that new business and being supported through that um, because I think that so many business owners, irrespective of how big their business is, even if they only have a few advisors, can really learn and adapt their processes to something quite similar. Mm. Practically, how do you track this? How do you review it? How do they make sure that they're on track? Do people get to see each other's scorecards and where they're at? What does that look like inside your business at the moment? Um, that's been one of the hard parts. That is hard. Reporting, you know, the the umpteen different data points that we've had to pull together um, in an ever-changing landscape has been really quite hard, mm. especially when you do change tech stack and you you try to build efficiencies in the business and, and you're, you're going through an evolution that means you do change the way that you do things, where you do them, how you do them every now and then. Yeah. It's been a lot of long nights. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're at the point now when we're, no, we, no, we don't. And that may be something, you, you know, you asked that question before, what what are the changes? The changes might be um, how it's reported. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a softie and I, mm-hmm. I, where I have something that is, that is potentially going wrong, maybe at those particular points in time or, or you know, where there's a, a, a competition or a, a, a leaderboard or whatever it might be for whatever reason, a campaign at the time or whatever it might be. I'm, I'm all about that visibility. Okay. If anybody wanted to scratch below the surface and dig for these results, they'd ultimately be able to see them anyway. Okay. But as far as reporting the balance scorecards and the achievement of those and people's targets, I have kept that fairly squarely between myself and the individual. And do you have a piece of tech specifically that you use to track this or is it Excel spreadsheets or what is it? It's a number of different... Um, a number of different data points that all just get pulled together. Right. Like I say, it's a lot of long nights. And you do that. Yeah. I think it's important. You know, as part of my role as a leader to motivate and try to get these guys um, in a position where they are engaged and working the way that we need and want them to, Mm -hmm. um, that's just part and parcel of what I have to do. Right now, I designed it, and if if you, you build it, they will come. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it's working. It's taking a little bit longer for me than I'd like at the moment, but that's fairly constantly being refined. The KPIs are put together. The the financial side's put together quite readily by the operations team for me on a monthly basis. Okay. Um, the other parts of it I need to pull together from, from some um, product manufacturers and from other tech providers. Some of it can come out of Xplan and Compay. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is then just, you know, task and thread benchmark reporting and those sorts of things. Okay. Um, so, that yeah, there's a few different data points. It would be great just to be able to hit a button. I'm getting it down to a fine art now, though, and it's, it's, really, it's really not that hard. It's okay. really not that hard. And it's monthly that you're looking at this data? Monthly. Uh, the intention will be to do a quarterly catch-up, but monthly tracking. So monthly tracking to the individual and a quarterly catch up to unless I'm asked to catch up otherwise if mm. there's anything dire of course if there's a serious anomaly yeah sure. it'd, it'd be silly not to not, not to point that out and do something about it but otherwise if everything's tracking well give the people the time to do what they do best I don't like meetings for the sake of meetings no me neither me neither um this is so interesting and I think gives a lot of people a lot of consideration, not only for advisors, but for staff in general about how we monitor, motivate, reward, incentivize, give certainty to people, I think is more than ever very important when you've got so many people who are potentially thinking about whether they're in the right home or not. We know that so many people just in general are thinking that. So um, I haven't seen that done really well inside a business before, which is why I wanted to hear more about it. The other thing that I want to talk about, because of course I always run out of time, but we're not going to run out of time because this is a really important piece. You have this really unique avatar marketing approach for each of your advisors. I'd love for you to spend just a couple of minutes 
educating us on what it is, mm-hmm. and then you know me, I'll ask questions from there. Sure, ask questions as you go too, because I'll I might just ramble. <laughs> um, okay, so. Daniel has been really, really successful. The CEO has been really, really successful with um, with marketing in this business from the jump. Okay. Um, there's been some. There's been some real uh, focus, I suppose, and investment in that part of our business, and it has um, it succeeded to the extent that had, there has been a couple of spin off businesses that have been really successful in their own right, that have been born off the back of that success. Mm. Um, one of which um, provides the framework, copy, um, processes, procedures, and those sorts of things for the marketing that we use through another, another business that Daniel has um, stood up called Marketing Branding Sales. Um, another that we that we have at the moment um, that is in beta phase called My Money Sorted is that on a larger scale again, mm-hmm. which is like a, a an Australian consumer financial literacy type website and just education of clients that can't necessarily afford to or haven't engaged in the fee paying advice ecosystem. Yeah, um, but just giving them the ability to get in, learn what they need to and and want to about whatever they're Googling at that particular point in time Mm -hmm. um, and then have the ability to close the feedback loop in some way, shape or form. So he has put together this this marketing engine and has had success with this marketing engine um, with the use of, you know, Google Analytics, a lot of SEO work, but really driven by avatars, as as you said. Say more. So... We, we will go back to the conversation that you and I had before, and we've both been BDMs before. We have. And I like to think that I'm a pretty agreeable type of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm not, I, I try not to be hard to get along with. Um, but in some circumstances, you just your personality is not going to resonate. Mm-hmm. Your specialty, your specialty and your personality – just may not be on the resonant frequency of the other individual that you're talking to. Your communication style, your interests, your age, your whatever mm-hmm. might not resonate. So it's really important, especially now, that both as a business and an, as, as an, an advisor, you are really certain about the client that you are looking for, the client that you can best serve, and the client that you enjoy serving. Financial advice now, as we're all aware, and is consistently spoken about ad nauseum, right? We have uh, forums every day about the increase in costs to deliver advice, the uh, unavailability of advice. We talked about it a second ago with the, mm. the you know, the project that we've got going on. Mm. Um, we need to be really sure about who it is that we serve so that we can market to those individuals because not only is that good for us organically to be very certain about who we can take on who is going to be able to aff- who is going to be able to afford to and also see value in the advice that we provide but who's going to engage in that long term and he's not just going to be that flash in the pan type transactional relationship and and what you do so uniquely is you take marketing so seriously that you think about avatars advisor by advisor. Yes. Correct? So, and that, that, yeah, that goes back to what I was saying. You will just find that some people don't resonate with you. Yeah. You know, we've got a, an advisor in our business at the moment who's just gone through his PY, his professional year, mm. um, and he's 24. Mm-hmm. I don't think his advisor avatar is that 85-year-old pensioner mm-hmm. you know i'm just throwing it out there yeah right well, i mean even between glenn and i who have had fox and hair for a while like he has a very different style to me mm. and so we have naturally attracted and retained retention is probably the big part actually correct, correct. we've retained people that are quite different because stylistically how we work and how we add value even though it's the same demographic it's the same target market but it's the style. You talk differently. We talk differently and we coach differently, mm. crucially. Um, how have you done that practically? Oh, um, <laughs> the side. <laughs> try, a, a lot of trial and error, mm-hmm. but, it, but it is just being um, 
a lot of trial and error, okay, a lot of analysis and a lot of paid analysis and research. Um, so we. So can, can we just step back for a sec? Yes. For my for my large brain that's just yes. had coffee and I'm waiting for it to kick in. So presumably you went down the path of explaining to all the advisors. A, marketing works. B, marketing just at a practice level is not exactly how we want to do it. We want to niche down and we want you Mm -hmm. all to have an avatar. You presumably went through an exercise to get everyone to think about or learn about who they best work with. Yep. And then does everyone have their own marketing plan? Do you get them to do social media? My brain is exploding questions. Help me. So it's like a funnel. Okay. It's like a funnel. We will try to incorporate – so – what overarches this is the ideal client for the business. We, yep. we are really set on what our minimum fees are and those types of things. So we feed all of the individual avatars up into what the overarching ideal client for the business would then be. Okay. We will take all of these people that are going to be in this band yep. with the ability to engage with us long-term, retention being very important. Sure. We use a lot of... Wizardry, I'll call it, because I'm, I'm not a marketer. Yeah. V- v- believe wholeheartedly in the the avatar and, and the way that we do things, but I'm not the the semantics behind how it's done with the SEO work. Oh, me neither. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. We'll speak wiz- human for yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah. good, good. That's really a relief. <laughs> um, but uh, the overarching theme, I, th- I suppose, is that the uh, – fr- the Google AdWords, the Facebook, um, and all of the other different streams of uh, marketing that the team are doing then funnel into a central spot. Yeah. Because we are then um, so focused on the client outcome, and we discussed this this morning too, you still organically engage some clients that are just not going to be the right fit. And it's really, really – it's a tough conversation, terrible conversation. It is. So there is the engagement part where we were – where the marketing that is done from an overarching point of view is, I won't say skewed, I'll say directed, um, so that it is being pushed out through certain publications – um, it's going to appear in certain uh, demographics okay. that are that have the higher propensity to engage, so that your funnel catches, you know, at, at least a decent standard deviation of the people on either side of what you're looking for in the first place. Mm. It then goes through a vetting filter. So we have some beautiful people in our business that are really high EQ that call up these clients and do an initial meet and greet questionnaire, get an idea of who they are, what they're about, what they're looking for, and those sorts of things, and ascertain whether they are going to be a fit in the first place. And they either do – and they get all of that information that then allows us, based on the particular client avatar, we'll call it as well, to align them to the individual advisor based on their specialty Ah. and the demographic of client. Okay. Um, Or they do the nice letdown as well and they provide some, you know, some really good hints and tips, an informational pack to send them in the right direction if they're not a fit right now for us to potentially engage in the future or to, to set them on the right course rather than just saying, oh, you're not right, beat it. They're the matchmaker. Yep, they are the matchmaker. So they are. So you're using, obviously, the power of... Um, it's easy to call it vetting. It's like, you know, it'd be really easy just to call it vetting, but that's a bit of a dirty word. It's matchmaker is much nicer. It's, they're the cuddler. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I've, I've now coined that. You can go back and take that into your business. And so, so actually, it's different to what I thought. Your matchmakers, if you will, know the avatars, know the advisors really well, know who they best serve, and they are matching... From that outlay. Yep. So you've obviously got all of the tech piece and the SEO piece, which we can't talk about because we don't understand it enough, but Correct. they're directing people to your business. Yep. The matchmakers are then learning more about that person, aligning them with the right advisor Correct. who's going to add the most value. Correct. And how big is your marketing team and matchmaking team? Marketing team, um, we've got a head of marketing. We get copy done. Um, so I've got... Because of the different businesses that we run, like we were saying, mm. so we sort of rob from 
Peter to give to Paul, and there's a lot of cross pollination that happens between those two. Okay, put it at three and a half. FTE. Okay, so many advice businesses would love the idea of having three and a half marketing FTE, but it wouldn't happen. Would you recommend for those smaller peeps pay a marketing company? Mm. Like, do you see so much value in it that it just makes complete sense to outsource that? That's where you can't marketing branding sales came from. That's where that other business came yeah. from. It's it's sense in the dollar, the sense in the dollar ability to have all of this intellectual property yeah. delivered on a subscription basis for you to just implement and execute. And plug and play. Yeah. And what's your matchmaking situation? Is that one person's full-time job? Is that someone that's in customer service that then picks that up? How big is that for you? Uh, it's changed a few times, actually, um, to a to bit of trial and error again. Yeah. Um, we had a full-time resource doing it. Okay. And she, they were the client experience type role. Like you say, it's, it, it, it's really... Um, this is a t- this is a tough part because I suppose we're in a pretty blessed position in a business of scale. We have the ability to have all of these really defined individual roles within the business. Yeah, it's it's a blessing, I su- uh, really. Yeah, but we had her leave, um, so we tried a different way. We thought that we're really big advocates of um, uh, internal promotion, so a lot of our support team are actually professional year candidates. We're really big on trying to grow. Oh, thank you. Yeah, great to, uh, grow the advisor numbers. So we have currently in our business of the support staff, I'd say three, quarter of them, three quarters of them are PY candidates. Yeah, right. Our Erin office, every single support staff member in the office are PY candidates for the future. Mm, cool. Um, I thought from a growth perspective when they left it might be good for them to jump on the phones and be doing some of these client interactions your face tells me that it didn't turn out how you thought it was going to they they did really really well but it's a quite a specialized mm. skill set it really really is that and that's one of the things that i have come to be um, really conscious of in this ever-growing business is that and this is um it's quite well known too there's a book called the e-myth by a guy called Michael Gerber. Mm -hmm. I think that any small business owners out there should read. He's looking at me very intently. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And it teaches you about all of these different roles that people play in the business as the entrepreneur, the management, and the technician. And even the technicians, um, what I'm trying to say is there's different people in the business, different skill sets. Some people that are really good advisors are terrible business owners. Mm -hmm. Some that are really good business owners, the advice piece falls off a cliff. Mm. Some people that are great administratively, t- their technical advice probably lacks. You know, I, I'm generalising. No, I think but, it's fair. But but uh, uh, there's there's certain skill sets and there's certain resonant frequencies that people are just on. Advisors tend to advisors, and our our professional year candidates tend to be really good technicians to do the lovey cuddly engagement and soft letdown piece. Yes. That's why I thought that it was going to be a good, uh, it was going to be a good exercise in the first part because they need to learn how to do that really well mm. because it's something that they will come across quite often. But from a, a conversion point of view yeah. and a commercial point of view, I just needed it to be sharpened up a little bit, and we just have this, the a, a couple of really bubbly, vivacious people in the business that are fantastic for it. There's those, there's those people that you can feel smiling on the other end of the the phone, and if that's mm. the first interaction you're having with the business, it, it, you know, start. it tends to be a pretty good start. <laughs> I have made this. Um, I, I made that error. Yeah. I made that error, and I completely undervalued my sales experience in the past, and thought it was really uh, easy. And I have learned that that's not at all. So it's a it's a painful lesson to learn it at that point in the funnel as well, because yep. that's when opportunities dry up and people have walked away because they haven't necessarily got the experience that you think that they would have got. So yep. painful lesson. Um, my dear, we've we're running out of time, which is just the saddest thing because I have so many questions for you. But in terms of the avatar piece, is there before I get into the rapid fire questions and then I let you go on with your very busy day mm. uh, conquering the world? Um. Any other lessons, learnings, uh, pieces of hope and joy for anyone who you think should embark? I think everyone should embark on this because, you know, just listening to you, I just had this revelation that when you're a BDM, you're trying to be uh, as open to all relationships as possible because there's such a commercial – you get lumped with this target and you've got 
a pretty um, finite amount of time to get as much business as possible. So you are trying to be all the things to all the people. And now that has completely flipped on its head and it's like no niche down. There's enough opportunity in the big wide world of advice. The more you can be really quite narrow in who you best serve, the more you're going to attract those people who will stay around. So I think we as advisors are getting used to that, um, which is a completely different way of thinking about it. But anything else that you would help us with on this journey if you had fewer resources than you have? Yep, and you are so right in everything that you say. Uh, And it's not just about getting business and getting new clients in the door. It's ensuring that any and every client interaction that you have, you are really conscious of how that will end, be that them coming on board or not, Mm. and what that looks like. Mm. So it's really liberating to know what you want. Mm. It is really liberating. Totally. To not even want to try to be all things to all people, to clearly be able to articulate and understand in yourself even these high EQ people that we've got on the other side of the on the other side of the telephone to these people, you know, for them it's really hard to say no. But if they understand why, mm. if they understand the commerciality behind why where a client's going to see value and where they're not and where the absence of value is just – it's just going to be something that's untenable. Um, it's really empowering for the people. And just, you know, one comment that I want to make is that the being re- really certain about what you do, how you do it, and the individual avatars of the advisors, making sure that that does talk upwards to the overarching strategy of the mm. business – because I will say that there are some certain things within our business that we don't specialize in and we won't do. They are strictly removed from everything that we market. So we don't even have to sort, even if it would be high value, we don't have to sort that wheat from the chaff. It, it does, it, it does start with the individual, the, the business avatar and what we're looking for from a commercial point of view and then filter down to the individual advisors avatars but where there is a where there's specific strengths and weaknesses you have to make sure that that talks back up as well mm. um, because it, it, you know the, in those conversations if if there's a perception that it should be high value or they could be high value but you're pushing away clients or having those conversations with clients it can be quite disappointing um, and that can affect some of the things that happen in the periphery or ratings, your reviews, your things that need to be working in the ecosystem that you're that, that you're trying to game, yeah. I suppose, to get this whole thing working in the first place. Every client needs to be important. Love it. Okay, we can't talk any more about this stuff okay. because otherwise we're going to talk all day. Um, but before we go into the rapid fire questions to, to round out, I think today's session has been hugely valuable. How can people learn more about you and your business if they want to find you on the... I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Um, the business is the Coastal Advice Group. Mm-hmm. Um, I am on LinkedIn, Mitchell Ramsbotham. Yes, that's your name. Uh, all of my contact details will be on there, and okay. I am always more than happy to talk to anybody and everybody. I think that the more conversations you, that you have, if you walk away from an interaction with anybody from any walk of life and you can take one little thing away from multiple different conversations, it just turns into a snowball that makes you... So much better. So much better. The aggregation of marginal gains. I love it. Right. Um, right. Rapid fire questions to round out today's conversation, which has been absolutely brilliant. Your life sounds crazy. Tell me what you do to look after your mental health. Uh, healthy body, healthy mind. Mm, you're big on this, huh? Yeah, really big on this. I look back at the times in my life when I was, and I've probably let it lack a little bit recently just due to things, yeah. but but it's a real focus again for me now because I truly believe that in the, the times in my life when I have focused more time and energy on myself and my own personal health is when I have shone from a professional level as well. Mm. It really, really does work. And I've seen the ebb and flow of it and I can actually put a pin in it and say, that's not rubbish. It really does work. Yeah. Uh, good reminder for me. Uh, tell me a piece of advice that you would give to young Mitch. What would you tell young Mitch? For me, you'll never know what you want to be when you grow up. <laughs> okay. Because I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Have you grown up? No, never, no, never will. But I think um, it, you, I think when you're younger, 
you put a lot of pressure on yourself. And I think it, it's it's just the nature of the beast that young kids have a lot of pressure put on themselves, on them, I suppose, to make decisions at very young ages to be – and you pigeonhole yourself. You head down this track. Just never be too certain of what you want to be or do when you grow up because you might – you put your blinkers on and lose sight of something that could be really quite amazing. Um, I've taken a couple of different tracks in my career, you know, on the same sort of path but diverged somewhat. Mm. And some of those different tracks have been um, vastly different to what I originally studied and thought I wanted to do with my life, but yeah. so rewarding. So take your blinkers off. Don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't be too sure of what you want to be when you grow up. Love it. Um, what is something big on your bucket list that you haven't done yet? Um, so partially achieved, but mm-hmm. bucket list for me is when I was younger, um, I got I worked through getting my pilot's license. It was just a goal achievement thing that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But there's a few more certifications that you need to go through um, to be able to fly passengers. The biggest bucket list thing for me will be able to hire a plane and fly my family away for a holiday, I just think would be one of the most zany and out of control experiences to have. Uh, that's bucket list. I've done a lot of travel. I've done a lot of cool stuff, but I think just something that I focused on as a personal aspiration for a long time to be able to, like the feeling of it is out of control, to be able to bring everybody along for the ride would just be crazy. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that sounds insane. Um, Last question. Do you have a book for me to read as part of my fake, although I have received requests to turn it into a real book club, but for my fake, currently fake book club? I do. And it was originally given to me by one of my previous managers. Mm -hmm. Um, The book is called Legacy by an author named James Kerr. Okay. Um, It is, it's based around the, the All Blacks who, when you think about it, are the most successful rugby team ever. One, I think the number was like 75% of all international games. You know, there is some real so, – There's if you're not a f- football head, mm-hmm. um, it, 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 it's very rugby-oriented and, and there's a little bit of cliche in there, but sometimes, you know, repetition, it gets – gets the gets the outcome right so there's a lot of cliche in there there's a lot of things in there that you've heard before there's a lot of things in there that are probably revisited from stuff that you've heard previously but there's some really good ones from a leadership point of view okay they are things like sweep the sheds which is from a management level nothing is beneath anybody mm-hmm. you know you, you need to be able to and willing to get in there and do the granular the and the nitty gritty and mm. you know clean the toilets if that's what you need to do because you, you're in a small business mm. Um, keeping a blue head, which is around uh, decision-making under pressure. Generally, bad decisions aren't made through a lack of skill or innate judgment. It's because of an inability to handle the pressure at that pivotal moment. You have all of the things. You know all of the book stuff. You've read the manual, but you're the doing it. It's the doing it. Mm. Um, there's a there's a lot. Of, you know, and it start, It sounds a little bit cliche, but there's some, there's about ten different sections through the book, and I've actually passed this book on to a couple of other people in the business because it's really big. There's some some really big thematics sort of in there. One another one of them, which is what you do, around what you do today. Um, and it's plant trees. Uh, be a good ancestor. Plant trees now that you will never see. Mm. So making sure that you're not just doing things to get them done and putting a Band-Aid on it, you're doing them the right way so that something beautiful happens in the future. It's It does sound a little bit cheesy and a little bit cliche, but for me it it really resonated. No, I love it. Um, This has been such a good conversation, if nothing more, just to be close to someone who I'm doing an interview with, but especially because it's you and especially because you've added – an enormous amount of value into a business over a tiny amount of time. I can't wait to see your continued success. So I want to say a huge congrats for jumping into, I was going to say the dark side, but maybe it's maybe it's not the dark side, the light side, it's been, the advice side. It's been fantastic, yeah. And I have no doubt that you're going to continue to do amazing things. So Mitch, a huge thank you for being today's guest. Thank you, and I really appreciate the opportunity. 